special to today's uh, podcast. I am excited to have Nadia on the podcast. Nadia, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you so much for reaching out and inviting me. I really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. Nadia, um, I was very fascinated by uh, your story when uh, we connected earlier, just uh, for me to get to know you a little bit better. Um, I would just want you to introduce yourself. Tell us about uh, who you are, um, your background, the journey that you've walked uh, to be where you are today. Thanks so much, Sarah. I'd love to. Yeah, so um, I grew up in a small town in the south of Johannesburg, Lanasia, not so small anymore. Um, you know, it was I, I was raised by my parents, uh, Siva and Poppy Viren, and I had an elder brother and elder sister. And it was a good, good upbringing, sheltered, <laughs> quite sheltered, as you can imagine. Um, but also, I think we we had struggles that I didn't realize until I got much older and I became a parent myself. Um, but it was a really good upbringing. Um, my folks taught me a lot. My dad pretty much grew me up, you know, you know, being with the boys, being with the girls, didn't matter. Um, fixing cars, changing light bulbs, you know, pretty much being very independent. And I think I spent the rest of my life staying independent. Um, I, I pretty much um, went into tech really early in my career. Um, I started out uh, on help desk like most people do. And eventually, you know, I tried studying um, tech and I hated it. <laughs> and I never thought I'd ever get into it. And I ended up studying marketing management for some reason. Um, and, then, and, and then didn't go into that either. And I still fell into tech uh, eventually. And um, it's been fun so far. It's almost 20 years being in tech. Um, and I spent a lot of my 20s doing a lot of fun stuff, traveling, um, riding motorbikes. Um, and then eventually I settled down, um, pretty much 30 years old, I settled down and uh, became a wife and, and not so long ago became a mom as well. And I have two little boys, uh, beautiful boys who are the light of my life. Um, so yeah, being being a mom is probably the most toughest but most rewarding job I've ever done in my life and that's my favorite job so far and yeah the last few years I've spent uh, being a information security specialist and being a CISO and I, and I love it I, I fell into it mistakenly yet again um, and I think with my personality and I'm very OCD um, it's just it's the right career path for me beautiful 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 um i love the fact that uh, you are a mom and uh, you know you still have a tech job um you know um a security information uh, job but uh, people always associate uh, this industry with uh, long working hours how has that uh, worked for you being a mom and juggling your job yeah, I think, you know, it is, it is a long, long working hours. I think being in tech generally is long working hours, right? Because the um, hackers and criminals and, and servers going down doesn't have a time. Um, it happens at the oddest times. So I think it's just about managing your expectations and having a good support system. I'm lucky that my husband is is so supportive. He's also pretty much, I, I used to often make jokes and say he is a better mom than me some days. <laughs> because he's taken over the role as well you know he cooks he cleans he looks after the boys um when i when i've even got to go for, for for work for a few days you know he's that he's that backbone of our family as well so it's great to have that support uh, my folks are still there as well and they also provide a lot of support for me so i think i'm just fortunate to be honest with you sarah but it is juggling it's a lot of juggling it's very demanding i'm not gonna lie but i think if like anything in life if you really want it and you really want to do it, you're going to make the time to do it, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful. I can totally identify that support system is so important uh, to, um, to, to a girl's success in this industry. Uh, you need to make sure you've got um, a good support system behind you so you can actually be able to do what you do best as well. Absolutely. Yeah. 
let's then backtrack and uh, let's talk about uh, how you got started uh, in tech. How did you get uh, started uh, in tech? Uh, so, you know, you finished high school. Did you even think you were going to go into tech uh, those, whatever, 20, 25 years ago? So no, Sarah, like, um, you know, I pretty much studied computer science at school as well. I was pretty good at it. I, I won't even lie to you. It was one of my favorite subjects. I was probably the best at it in school. Um, but I pretty much hated the maths and the coding part of it. And, and I kept saying to myself, no, you don't want to do this. You don't want to do this all your life, you know, sit behind a computer and code. And and so I went to university and I, and I thought about it and I was like, OK, should I do law? Should I do, you know, ComSci or? Or information systems and then I was like okay let's do ComSci like let's try it out and I did for that first year again it just reiterated how much I hated coding right and and the maths portion of it and and I sat there and I was like it's not that I was bad at it I wasn't bad at it I think I was pretty good actually um but I just I couldn't see myself really sitting behind a computer and just no communicating with people. I mean, my personality needs, you know, everybody else to to vibe off my own energy and then for me to vibe off everybody else's. So I I, I changed. I I actually I decided I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna change my 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 career and I'm gonna study study marketing management, right? And like I was explaining. Um, when I was when I was with my folks and when I matriculated and, and went into varsity, you know, things were tough and my folks couldn't really afford that. Um, so the first year was hard as well. So that and, and then ma me making the decision to change, I felt a bit compelled to say, you know what, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave it and I'm going to actually go and study on my own through UNISA and pay for it myself because I still had student loans from the first year and my folks you know, it wasn't their it wasn't their choice at the end of the day. So why should they suffer financially for my choices? So I left and um, I went to go find a job, and um, you know, I worked at odd jobs here and there, and 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 studied marketing. And then my my sister was already in tech, right? And she was she was working in a pretty pretty tech role, you know, like she was you know setting up servers and and doing the weird stuff. And she said to me, come, come work for me. Like, I'm looking for someone. And I was like, she's like, you already know most of it. Like, you know, and I was like, oh, okay, interim, let me just go, <laughs> you know, sort of thing while I'm studying. And um, funny enough, Sarah, I went back into coding. <laughs> it's coding again. And, um, you know, you know, it's, it's weird. It's weird. And, um, but I, but I got stuck into it. Right. And, Again, I hated it. Um, so eventually I got out of coding, but I stayed in tech. I stayed in tech because I actually decided and I found I did love it. I loved the the, the mm. challenge. I loved that it changed all the time, that you didn't, it wasn't the same. It wasn't the same, you know, you, you fill out a spreadsheet and I hope finance people don't knock me for this one, but you fill out a spreadsheet and it kind of stays the same. And, you know, this is, it changes at every moment. And no matter which industry you're in, it's always going to change and it's going to keep changing. So that was exciting. That was really exciting for me. So eventually I found my niche when I went into management because then I could kind of find the fix, right, of dealing with people, but then also still touching the tech. And then um, pretty early on in my career, in my 20s, mid, mid to late 20s, one of, one of the bosses I worked with, um, and it was pretty much in a male-dominated uh, environment. I was the only female that they had hired. I was the only female and I was the only person of color that they had uh, employed for the first time and I literally worked with uh, 16 guys and um, he pretty much said you know what you do a really good job between talking tech to the tech guys but you also can talk business to business people so be an account manager be a service delivery manager and kind of get that conversation going and i found when i used to i could understand the code so what we would do is i would go and get the requirements for the clients and for the customers and then i would be able to go and give it to the coders and the developers and everybody else and then we'd get what we wanted you know and there was a whole lot less back and forth and that's where i found my niche and and and, and i got pretty much you know taken over to a to a client and and that's where i fell into information security um, so it's been a long 20 years of tech, but, you know, of, of, of finding the thing that I'm good at. And generally it is, it's, it's understanding the technology 
it's being super interested in the tech, but then being able to talk to people and just decipher that for everybody else and 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 make it understandable and make it make it almost you know user friendly that everybody mm. will be able to touch it at any time. So I always laugh, mm. you know, I made it so user friendly, and my dad often phones me when he has an error on his DSTV and he's like, what does this mean? <laughs> I'm like, no, I don't, I don't do that tech. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So the point of our conversation today is to talk about the bias that exists in the tech industry, especially as it pertains to uh, the women. Uh, let's talk about uh, the challenges that uh, you've had to deal with both personally and uh, at a professional level in the industry. Yeah, Sarah, you know, that's that it's, it's, I think it's sometimes it's, it's a bias that people aren't even aware of, which, you know, which we refer mm. to as the unconscious bias. And a lot of the time it's, it's sometimes it is conscious. I've faced a hell of a lot of cha challenges. Um, you know, like I said, in the early part of my career, when I worked with, the, with that team, that was just pretty much only males, right? And myself, that that I didn't that I didn't really feel it. I mean, I, I think I was on the same level as them. And, you know, everybody was happy to have this difference in opinion. And, and, I, and I don't think I rubbed anybody wrongly. But you almost feel different as well, because you go away on weekends or you go, um, you know, for team building or you with the guys in a in an in informal setting like a restaurant, uh, having a couple of drinks for for year end or for you know whatever the occasion may be, and you notice it. You you notice it because you are singled out, and people around you look at you weirdly, right? And they're like, oh, it's like you know the 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 women are amongst all the men, you know. And I pretty much got that a lot in my career because, and and I did because I I hung around main majority of my career that that's just who you know who we were um and then and then i think the, the 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 real challenges i faced is when i started moving up the ladder and you started being you know pretty much looked at as being okay i think this person could do really well and um and and and, and then my colleagues felt a bit threatened so a lot of the time i i, I got that type of challenges where um you know and it wasn't may have not been done purposely but you know you have things that are said to you um and and done to you that automatically make you feel singled out and i remember one particular occasion where i just become a mom you know for the first time mm -hmm. and you know as a woman that is so difficult being a mom for the first time and um you know i i pretty much walked into a management meeting the first time i came back and the first day being back after leaving your kid is so hard right and um and i got asked oh w w you know who's the baby with weren't you supposed to be breastfeeding um you know and that for me was it was difficult questions because already i was struggling leaving my child and yet i i asked myself if a man had walked into the room and just his wife had just given birth, would he had, have got the same questions? And most likely not, right? So, you know, and, and, and people weren't conscious of my time as well because I would always be available, readily available before I had kids. Um, it was easy for people to just assume that I would still be the exact same. Um, and, and, I, and I pretty much for the first two years of my first son's life, I have a lot of guilt for missing out on a lot of occasions because I wasn't there for some of his vaccines. Um, some days I would get home and he was already sleeping. I would leave before he would wake up in the morning. And those days were hard because people, people put unexpected pressures on you as of being a senior leader in the team uh, and a manager. Um, so that made it really tough, really, really tough. And I hope... I hope to see one day that that woman don't ever have to feel that again. Mm, 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 mm. Thank, thank you, Nadia, for sharing in a very authentic and vulnerable way. And as a woman, I actually want to cry, you know, just uh, listening to your story um, of uh, just, uh, you know, being able to juggle that whole, um, uh, you know, professional life and being a new mom and um 
you know, that desire of wanting to be available for those immunizations and that you can't be there. Um, I think we do need to have a new conversation in the workplace um, that starts allowing for these things, uh, um, mm -hmm. you know. So mm -hmm. yes, we're coming to, to work as uh, workers, but uh, mm -hmm. we're not just a one dimensional human being. You come into yes. work as a mom, uh, like you're saying, you're coming to work as a new mom. Um, mm -hmm. Is the workplace uh, making spaces for that so that a person okay. can be able to live a well balanced life without dealing with guilt, uh, you know, um, that uh, you've missed out or you haven't been available mm -hmm. because the work mm -hmm. has just sucked you in and uh, there hasn't been recognition to understand that, um, uh, you know, even though you are a worker and you need to deliver, you're also a mom and that role is in as important as well. Um, yeah, so we need to elevate this conversation. Absolutely, Sarah. I mean, I think back to, and I'm not the only person that had had this challenge is, I listened to another friend of mine's story the other day. It's breastfeeding, right? That's a great example. I had to stop breastfeeding my first son because I had no way to express. Like, I, you know, I, I would need to go and express in the bathroom. And, and, and that's also not okay. Like, you know, it's not okay mm -hmm. to do that. All the meeting rooms were glass. Um, uh, all the offices were glass, you know. So where do you go and sit? And and I remember, I remember a friend of mine a few weeks ago literally told me the same thing. She used to express in a server room, and I mean, you know, it's it's not okay. People used to walk in on her, and 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 I and I think you're right. It's a different conversation we need to have that needs to change at a at a senior level. That needs to recognize that women still can be super powerhouses in their career while still being a mom. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think the responsibility is on us as women as well. We need to be speaking up, um, uh, you know, so that uh, people can then start um, hearing our stories. Like we're saying now, like what we're doing now, mm -hmm. you're speaking up to say, mm -hmm. look, I've had to deal with uh, guilt because I had to leave uh, my little child behind. And also just the fact that I can't express, uh, you know, a breast milk for my child because the workplace has not allowed for that space for me. Uh, you know, it's mm. uh, expressing milk is a, a stressful activity on its own and to do it like in the bathroom or in a server, it's, I think it's just horrible. And, uh, you know, it's very sad that uh, there's no one who's actually mm. uh, giving thought to these things. Um, so I actually think uh, we need to have more of these conversations and mm. women need to start speaking up uh, um, towards mm. these things so that we raise yeah. the awareness and uh, people can start also thinking about the, the decision makers can yes. buy into um, this narrative that, uh, you know, women at workplace um, need uh, more spaces where they can uh, actually be able to uh, flourish and uh, do other activities that also impact their lives. Uh, for example, like expressing milk, uh, you know, I'm one of those uh, women that uh, will breastfeed until, uh, you know, my kids are nearly 24 months so you mm. know expressing breast milk is part of uh, my big side of my life um, yes. you know? so if the workplace does not provide for that uh, because uh, mm. you know you're a technology company you mm. all you have in mind is male um mm. it actually that's pushing out the women from um, the industry because uh, the spaces are not allowing for them um to be able to express or be who they yes. are and yes. carry on other responsibilities that are just as important to their lives. Absolutely. And that leads to the unconscious bias, right, Sarah? I mean, mm. that's exactly it. It's, it's you may have not thought about it or made a decision about it, but the fact it's happening and you don't know about it or you're not aware of it or you've turned a blind eye to it is exactly that. And 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 I want to tell you about an experiment that I kind of did a few weeks ago. And I think that's where you actually found me. <laughs> with regards yes, to I found that fascinating. Please tell us about that. <laughs> so, so, you know, and it was about this unconscious bias. And I kind of brought up a conversation with peers, in in a in the, in the CISO group, which is the security you know group, and and I said, 
you know, we don't have enough females. And what's the reason we don't have enough females in the space? And 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 we did the stats and, and out of the group of just over 200 people, there's only 18% of us that are female. female. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which for me is not a fair representation. I don't think, you know, I don't think that that's right. And and I said to them, I said, what what's the problem? Why aren't we, you know, why aren't we in the space? What's what's preventing us? And nobody kind of had an answer. So I said, okay, I'm gonna go find some answers. <laughs> and I said, I'll do a session. The next time we meet up for, for a workshop, I'm gonna do a session and I'm gonna come back with answers. And Sarah, I did so much of homework. I can't even tell you the amount of research and the amount of papers I read was incredible. That dated back to the 70s. And it was it was such a, an impactful thing, right? So I took all of this research and I said, I'm going to go and I want to do an impactful lesson. And I said, I want to workshop this in such a way that we can see the differences. And how did I, how do I do that? So what I did was, and I thought about this because I've seen um, variations of it on TikTok, right? About privilege. And it is about male versus female in a way, but the intention wasn't to show that. The intention was to show the unconscious bias, right? So I lined everybody up, you know, outside. And I said, okay, stand in a line and just, you know, everybody is in the same position. Nobody's ahead, nobody's behind. And I said, I'm going to ask you a series of five questions. And I said, if you can answer to the negative and say you've not experienced this, I'd like you to take a step forward. And everybody was looking at me, they're like, okay, sure, all right. And then I said, you know, and I kind of started off and I said, okay, so, you know, um, who here has never been, um, you know, asked about the caregiving of their children and when, they, when they've when they gone into work and most of the men took a step forward. Um, and I said, okay, so second question, who has never been told that they were being overly emotional or asked if they were on their period and all the men took a step forward <laughs> and then I said okay so who here has never experienced um, being sexually harassed at work and majority of the men yes there were a few men that, that stayed standing still but majority of the men took a step forward and it went on for the full five questions and um, and and the other two also quite impactful, right? But at the end of it, I said to the men, I said, okay, now look around, look around you, and we are the women. And almost all the women were still standing exactly where they started. And I said, if you have to relate this to life and you have to relate this to your career, I said, for every step you took forward, a female colleague you left behind to experience something that you will never know anything about. And uh, it got super emotional, obviously, um, you know, and, and, and I think the impact was there because when we calculated it, so there was just under 50 people in the room, when we calculated it, majority were male. Um, and I think there were seven females in the room. Out of the seven females, only three took a step. So there were three steps um, that were counted for. And there were 47 or 57 steps that the males took. Sure. It's just an astounding number, right? And and you think about what women have experienced in their careers for, compared to what men may have or may have not. And the fact is, is until that moment, they hadn't even realized it as themselves as men. They hadn't realized that there's, there's females that report to them. There's other colleagues. There's their daughters. There's their wives that may have experienced the exact same thing. But we all keep quiet about it. Why? Why do we do that? And then I went back into the room and, and, and the one I did in Johannesburg, I had not told anybody, but I invited my dad and he was in the room. And I didn't tell anybody that he was there. And I kind of said, at the beginning of the session, I asked everybody, I said, who has daughters? Yeah, and majority of the guys did pick up their hands. And I said, when I do this exercise and when I talk to you after, I want you to keep your daughter in mind all the time. And okay, came back into the room and I said, I gave them some of my stories and one of them was about the breastfeeding and, and some of the other not so pleasant things I've experienced, like being sexually harassed at work and, and stuff like that by senior management. And um, 
my dad sat through it all and he heard the stories for the first time. And at the end, I said, so nobody would have noticed, but a, a gentleman walked in um, just at the beginning of my session. And I said, um, it's actually my father. And I said, I am somebody's daughter. And um, I said, Dad, I know I'm putting you on the spot, but I want you to know, I want you to tell the gents in the room and everybody else, how do you feel hearing your daughter go through that? And he was super emotional. He, he was actually crying, right? And I've seen my dad cry maybe two or three times in my life. And and the tension and the emotion in the room, Sarah, I can't tell you. Everybody was just so emotional. The men finally got it because I'm somebody's daughter, right? I am, I'm somebody's daughter. And um, and someone asked me, you know, how come, what makes you so confident? And I said, it's how I was raised. It was also how I was mm-hmm. raised. I, I, was, I was raised to stand up. I was raised by my dad never to, to see a, a gender bias, never to see that boys can only do this and girls can only do that. I said, I did everything. My dad made me so independent that when I walked into a room full of men, I didn't feel uncomfortable. It's because I was used to it. Um, you know, my dad took me often for business trips and work trips when I was the only little, I mean, I was the only little child there as well. So I didn't ever feel it. And I said, it's that unconscious bias as well that we put girl children into a box, right? Mm. And we say, mm. don't, don't get out of that box. You belong in that box, but they mm. don't. What if they never get married one day? What if they don't have a man that is going to be there? What if you as a dad isn't there for her? tomorrow at the end of the day what then you've got to equip your daughter with the skills and you know just being independent that she doesn't have to rely on anybody else and I said we as boy moms have to do the exact same thing I mean I have to grow my sons up to cook and to clean and because Sarah one day we don't have anybody to rely on and there's no boxes Mm -hmm. nobody belongs in a box so that's Mm -hmm. where that all came from (laughs) beautiful beautiful Beautiful. And thank you for all the work that you're doing in uh, breaking the unconscious bias or also raising awareness. I find that um, activity quite impactful and powerful yeah. uh, that it left your dad uh, in tears. Uh, yeah, because people forget yeah. that, uh, you know, women are somebody's daughter, they're somebody's sister, yeah. you know. Yeah, so yeah, well done, well done for just raising um, that awareness. Um, uh, Thanks, Sarah. Let's, yeah, let's look at um, how then we can start breaking this cycle of um, unconscious bias, okay? Mm. So as the people on the receiving end, um, who are mainly the women, especially as we speak in the context of the tech industry, because uh, the women are the minority. Um, So they are, you know, generally quite vulnerable when it comes to um, Mm. unconscious uh, bias. What can women start doing to break this uh, uh, unhealthy cycle uh, that exists of uh, unconscious biasness in the industry. Mm. Mm. And I think that's the difficult part, right, is I think it's it's all about awareness. So I've kind of taken the stance that I need to do something about it right now. Mm. Me, myself, I need to do something about it. And um, and and so does, so does everyone else. Uh, I think everybody needs to make a decision and move forward. And everybody needs to say, okay, um, I'm going to not, I'm going to try not to be unconsciously biased. But how do we do that? It's it's the awareness. And and we create the awareness ourselves. So if you are someone that's experiencing that unconscious bias by someone else, point it out. Point it out and say, this is actually, you know, this this you may have an unconscious bias with regards to this, but you know, now that you know better, how do we change that? And I think it's also, again, the awareness that even though we don't know that that person has an unconscious bias or I don't have an unconscious bias, and let me tell you, (laughs) I've recently realized I also have an unconscious bias um, Mm. towards men sometimes, right? Is, is, Is not only women experience sexual harassment, men do too. Um, And I had my eyes open uh, about that recently. And I think that's what we need to do is we need to, we need to start talking about it a lot more because it is prevalent. It's there. It's, you know, it's, it's every time someone tells you, oh no, I'm not racist uh, or I'm not, you know, I'm not biased or 
Yes, you are. You just don't realize you are. You know, that's that unconscious bias, right? <laughs> if you would treat someone of color differently in a social setting compared to someone who works for you, then you 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 are you are biased, right? You 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 biased. So and I always bring that as that up as a great example. Um so 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 I think it's just you know, having these difficult conversations, Sarah, it's really difficult because trust me, I was super uncomfortable that day. I was super uncomfortable mm. having that conversation. It's not easy. Um, people do stand up. They want to challenge you. Um, I did get challenged. I did I did get asked if, if I'm not just being a victim, um, which is difficult. And you have to stand there and you have to say, actually, no, I'm not a victim. I'm The fact that I'm standing here and I've stood up for myself and I'm still standing up for myself every day means I'm not a victim. I'm still fighting. Right. Um, so yeah, fight the good fight and, and, and talk about it more. If we don't talk about it, it's never going to be something that's addressed. Mm, 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 mm. Wonderful. Wonderful. And uh, on the other end, what would uh, the colleagues, uh, you know, uh, do that, uh, you know, who, who, who are, lucky not to have this unconscious bias yes we are saying uh you know the unconscious bias uh, exists uh, both ways but obviously we know that it's more leaned on one side um mm -hmm. what should the other people who are more on the privileged uh, side uh, where they've been more mm -hmm. accepted um you know i was just speaking to um one of the data scientists um you know that i'm gonna be interviewing uh, next week she says uh, when she was in school, she wanted to be an architect, okay? Um, and at some point, she also started thinking of doing computer science. And when she went to the careers teacher, the careers teacher, that was 20 years ago, said, no, oh, no, girls don't do computer science. So girls don't do um, mm. uh, architectural mm. uh, courses, uh, you know, find something that is uh, girlish. Um, you know, uh, needless to say that, uh, you know, she went, uh, you know, in a, in a direction that was non-technical, but then she sort of found her way back into the technical field. Mm -hmm. um, so then my question would be, uh, you know, what should, uh, especially the male counterparts, what should be their role? What should they be doing to just support, uh, 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 you know, the breaking of this unconscious bias? Mm. And again, it comes back to the conversations, right? So after we had that session, mm. that um, it was so eye-opening that most of those gents walked up to my father afterwards and they said to him, I want to be a dad like you. Actually, mm. I, I don't want to put my daughter in a box. I don't want mm. her to be personified as that. I want her to be able to go into tech and not have to experience those things. But it's also then taking that same conversation. And if you have a woman working for you, is mm. going to have that conversation with her at the workplace and saying, have you experienced these things? I need you to tell me. I need you to make me aware. As a manager, I have a responsibility to find out if my team is feeling like they're being objectified by everybody else, right? And, and I think that's super important because we have a responsibility as management, as, as executives, as you know, we don't know what's going on below us sometimes. We just don't. We don't know what's happening in the trenches. Um, you know, clients can can do the exact same thing to you. Sarah, I have often, even now, I'll go into technical meetings uh, surrounded by men, and I'm the only female, and, and they will talk past me. They will talk to my male colleague, right, that I brought with me. And my male colleague, who, who who's a good friend of mine, he'll often stand up and he says, He's, he looks at them and he's like, you do know you should be talking to Nadia, not me, right? And, you know, and that's him addressing that mm. unc unconscious mm. bias for me, you know, and I mm. applaud him for that because mm. he's done something and it's because I've made him aware of it. Mm. I've asked him, like, the first time it happened, I said, did you notice how they all spoke to you? And he's mm. like, yeah, I did, but only after he noticed. And mm. now, because I've told him that and I've made him aware, now he keeps noticing it. So I think mm -hmm. that's the trick, right, Sarah, is, is we don't even realize when we don't know something until we know it. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's the whole trick. So 
more conversations and 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 i think that leads me to you know something that i'm trying to do now is we've we've started this um you know this I, I won't call it a movement, but we started something that is called Journeys to Inspire. And it's looking and it's aimed at everybody. It's not aimed at women. It's not aimed at men. It's not aimed at people of color. It's aimed at everybody. It's aimed at people who felt like they were bullied. They were mistreated. They were they just weren't seen. A lot of the mm. time, you know, the kids who have ADHD or, or autism, high functioning autism in the corporate space, they just not understood, right? And why aren't you understood? Why are you putting in a box? Why are you putting in a box? Why are you reprimanded? It's because people don't understand you, and yet you have a story to tell. You have may mm-hmm. may have persevered to such an extent that you 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 overcome those things, and it's very few of us that have that have overcome that. And how did we do it? How did we get mm-hmm. there? And what are the lessons that we learned? And what are we going to do to make it better so the next generation doesn't feel exactly the same way we did? And that's all about that awareness. It's just trying to spread that word and 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 making sure that people start becoming more and more aware of how unfair that, you know, how unfair we can be sometimes um, based on, on unconscious bias. Mm, mm, mm. Mm. Uh, well said, and uh, you bring a lot of uh, great insights there uh, and uh, just very practical um, ideas that people can latch on uh, to help break the unconscious uh, bias. Uh, let's then bring the conversation uh, home. Let's talk about how you've been able to overcome those challenges. What have you done? Mm. It's tough. It's tough, Sarah. I think it's 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 toughening my skin. It's standing up and advocating when it's wrong. It's it's no longer keeping quiet. It's definitely no mm. longer keeping quiet. It's it's literally, I mean, I must admit, it's latching myself also onto people who are supporters, right? And then I know that are gonna stand behind me and looking for that circle and surrounding myself with the good. Um, that's been really important for me. I've literally left toxic workplaces, you know, because of 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 being, you know, objectified or subjectified, sorry, or whatever, you know, just not feeling good. Um, and and I, and I've chosen my mental health over and my physical health, to be honest, over over that over a job. Um, and I've and I've said and I've said to myself. My life, my kids' life, my my family life is actually more important than my job right now. Um, you know, and 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 because you bring it home, you do. You you feel mm-hmm. bad. People, you know, people are mean to you. People mistreat you, and you bring that 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 emotion and that sadness and that grief home with you. And you tend to take it out on your family. And I don't think that's healthy. And I think that's where I said I'm going to call it. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna look for something that makes me happy at the end of the day and that i'm i'm going to surround myself by positivity and good people and people that support me and the rest can just you know they can either they can either support or they can or they can fall on the wayside and you leave them behind you know sort of thing and that's work that's worked for me for the past i i I would call it two years it's definitely worked um you know is 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 choosing myself uh sometimes and also you know standing up standing up not not being quiet anymore just uh and, and people will not like you for it trust me <laughs> people won't like you for being uh for being loud and for being proud and for standing up um and and i'm okay with that i am okay with everybody not liking me <laughs> if i'm gonna get my message across i'm okay with it Thank you for being a great example for other women. Um, I think uh, I, I love what you're saying. You've got to make a decision to choose yourself. Um, you know, I think uh, no one should linger in a place where they're not being respected. Um, you know, people need to stand up for themselves. And uh, if anyone is sensing a sense of disregard, uh, you know, you stand up for yourself or, you know, um, exit the environment because then that environment is toxic mm-hmm. for you um, as a human being. So yeah, well said, well, well said. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it means it's not for you. Yeah. Thanks, Let's Sarah. Uh, it's, look at... Um, it's, yes. a, it's a generational Sorry, no, thing as well. Yeah. yeah. 
No, no, I was just going Absolutely. to say it's a generational thing as well, right? Is is a lot of the time we grew up as a, as a generation to be seen, not heard, right? And mm. and I think mm. that's worked against us. That's really worked against mm. us. And I'm trying to grow my sons up differently to say, you can be heard. You have an opinion. Mm. You, mm. you have likes. You have dislikes. You have emotion. Mm. You are entitled mm. to not be okay with being treated a certain way. And that's okay. Mm. And I can't give mm. them that lesson if I do not practice it myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Powerful. You've got to lead by example. Hey. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think they're a more assertive uh, uh, generation. Uh, you know, I just look at my kids. I mean, I've got a whole range from uh, one who's turning 21. I've got a 16-year-old. I've got a six-year-old. Yeah, they're just a different breed, you know, very self-assured, right. um, you know, that have boundaries and, uh, you know, that also insist to be treated a certain way uh, because uh, they feel uh, you know, they are dignified human beings, and I just absolutely admire that about them. Um, yeah, let's so look at I uh, um, you for that. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yes, <laughs> yes, seriously, you know, it's a journey, right? It's a journey um, yes. of growth for us as well. Uh, because uh, you know, we come from a place where uh, women didn't have uh, much of a strong voice. So, you know, we're growing in the process and, uh, yeah, you're passing on and uh, you're allowing your kids to have a voice and uh, to set boundaries for themselves, uh, which is just uh, beautiful, um, you know. Uh, yeah, I admire. I, I keep saying, you know, I wish I grew up in your generation. <laughs> but they say, oh, mom, it's got its own challenges. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's move our conversation wrapping up into um, just uh, sort of uh, highlighting things that you'd uh, consider to be setbacks for women in STEM. What things do you think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, act as setbacks for women in, uh, in the STEM industry? So I think it's also putting ourselves in those same boxes, right? It's, it's, it's saying, I shouldn't go for that career. It's oh, it's too technical, or I'm not technical enough. Um, and then and then allowing someone else to decide that for you as well. And a great example mm -hmm. is your data scientist, right? Um, we need to start breaking barriers to say that it's okay for you guys to be here. You belong here. You are actually smart enough to be here because no one's going to tell you you're not. And I think. That for me is something that's really important. And we got to start it from a school level, Sarah. We really do. Um, you know, is introducing girls and and other kids that that wouldn't ever think that they would go into a STEM type of, of, of career is say it's okay if you're not great at maths and science. There's other careers that are out there for you. They are. They, that's still technical, right? Um, and and I think that that's a barrier we do need to change. We need to change the curriculum almost as well of a schooling career, right? Is that you're not going to use those typical maths and science every day. I mean, it steered me away twice. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. pretty much I hated the maths and 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 you know the the, the sciencey part of it. And yet I loved, I loved the coding. I loved the but I, but I couldn't do the maths 101 and maths 201. And, and, and I think that's what steered me away. So if I look back at that, I think we need to decide that our curriculum, our our path, our the way we grow our kids up, it all needs to change a little bit. We need to start being a lot more inclusive. We need to feel we need to increase exposure on what everybody sees and everybody looks at, to be honest with you. And I think that would give so, so much of perspective to the STEM industry. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Nadia, this has been such a, a great conversation and just thank you for bringing so much insights and uh, for bringing, uh, you know, uh, vulnerable, authentic, uh, 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 you know, conversation as well, uh, you know, spaces that uh, people are sort of shy to, to go into. Um, thank you. And uh, you are just uh, um, a great representation of uh, what assertiveness 
looks like for the women in the STEM industry. So yeah, keep doing what you're doing and uh, yeah, keep raising uh, um, that banner for us. Uh, you know, I love the work that you are involved with and uh, everything uh, that uh, you are doing, you know, to break the unconscious bias in the industry. So in conclusion, um, do you have any concluding remarks that you'd love to leave our listeners with? Thanks so much, Erin. I really appreciate you picking up and, and coming to interview me because, you know, it's, it, it warms my heart that it has impacted people. One LinkedIn post, or one, one, I just wanted to change one person's life, just one person's life. And, I'm, and I feel like that message is getting us. And, and I think this new, you know, this new journey that we're on um, with Journeys to Inspire is something that people can really look forward to. And, and, I, and I wish and I hope that other people will join us on this, on this path uh, because there's so many kids that we can inspire from this. Our plan is to actually go into schools, make those changes. I'm not just talking the big talk. I want to walk that, that walk. It's going to be hard. I've got so much anxiety over it, you know. And I'm top as the whole. So anybody in the industry, I'm even going to call upon you and, and give us your story as well. And I mean, because you also in the tech industry and, and, and help us to change and to the ceilings for the next generation so that they don't suffer the, the consequences that we have to suffer as well. And I think that's, that's my parting words is it doesn't have to be hard. Let's not make it hard. Let's mm. make it easier. If mm. you're struggling, we've all struggled. If you're struggling now, come to me. I will try and help you as much as possible. If I can help you, I'll put you in touch with someone that can. But just reach out. I know it takes so much of guts to do that, but just reach out. And I guarantee you, your life can change. Mm, mm. Beautiful, beautiful. Thanks so much, Nadia. Um, you know, yeah, I'm quite open in any way that uh, we can support the initiative by all means. Uh, you know, this is a noble cause that you are involved in. Um, thank you so much for bringing so much insight. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, engaging with you. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's been a pleasure. Cheers, Nadia.